I have an urge to play Thaumaturge. I have an urge to play Thaumaturge. I have an urge to play Thaumaturge. I have the urge to be a Thaumaturge. Who are all of you? And I said it first. But this can't be about who just says it first. Yeah, that's not fair. There's got to be a better way to handle this. But we can't all be Thaumaturges. Yeah. Yep. Wait. A Thaumaturge is so versatile that it can fill so many party roles. For example, you... You said you wanted to be in the front and kill things, right? Uh-huh. And you, you wanted to scout ahead and be a leader of the whole party. Mm-hmm. And you wanted to heal and support allies. Meanwhile, I wanted to fling magic from the back. That means we could all be thaumaturges. Oh. Mm. And this is how they did it. Or we did it. Or I did it. I'm not making a classic shopping guide like I did for the psychic. Uh, there's already a great video by Nonat that goes over the options and the feats and the implements that people can look at. And honestly, I didn't want to do a whole lot of work uh, to do a video that already there is a video out uh, fulfilling that role. And so I decided to make a combat demonstration focused video that shows the versatility of the class. I did, however, prepare a very detailed outline for a theoretical class shopping guide on the Thaumaturge, which you can see in the video description. There's a link to it. And the TLDW of it is that the Thaumaturge is a near martial class, and I call it the knowledge is power martial. And it sacrifices some martial ability. It has eight hit points per level, which is a little low. It also has Charisma as its key ability score, proficiency in medium but not heavy armor, and as I found through play, its implements that it relies on often provoke reactions. So you don't always want to be in the front lines, but in exchange for that, you have unmatched versatility. You have a wide variety of skills. You are able to find out and know the weaknesses and resistances and abilities of enemies with your esoteric lore skill and you get to share that information with the party and also use funky items in your possession you are a hoarder and have all of these things on you last but not least you get to have one of nine implements at level one that give you special abilities within a certain niche and you get two more implements as you level up and you gain more abilities in those implements as you do. So with all of these abilities, you're able to fulfill a variety of traditional party roles in a D&D or Pathfinder party makeup. Additionally, combine all that with There's My Cat's Tale, um, all of these feats that let you dabble in a bunch of uh, things like spell casting, using magic items better, using scrolls of any tradition, making daily scrolls, and making daily talismans. All of this combines to make you the most versatile martial class. And that says a lot in a system that emphasizes diversity among characters. To highlight this, in my combat demonstration today, I've made a party of four thaumaturges that all are humans, that all have the background of scholar, and still make wildly different characters. Additionally, they only have feats from the Thaumaturge and no archetypes. Each of the four characters' builds you'll see in the video description. I'll include a link to their builds. The first character is Fofford. He is going to assume the role of a traditional fighter in the party. He has the weapon implement, which lets him have both a weapon and a shield. Normally a Thaumaturge cannot do that, because if they have a weapon in one hand, their other half a hand needs to be committed to their implement. And with the weapon implement starting at level one, was able is able to do a reaction that is similar to attack of opportunity on a creature whose vulnerability he has exploited with his special exploit vulnerability action. He also has uh, been built to tank. He has taken heavy armor proficiency. He has a lesser sturdy shield. He's taken craft skill to repair it. He has the shield block reaction as well. Additionally, he has the mirror implement so that he can project a copy of himself within 15 feet and he exists in both places. He had considered the amulet implement to defend his himself and allies, uh, but he did not do that because that 
its main ability is a reaction, which would compete with his implements interruption reaction. Next is Rose, who assumes the traditional rogue role in the party. She has taken up the lantern implement so that she can scout ahead of the party, and the lantern gives her a free secret role to look for secrets that include secret doors, hidden traps, environmental hazards, haunts, and even when she's not searching during exploration mode. And she also has taken the regalia implement, which gives her a bonus to charisma, uh, a number of charisma checks, and lets the party follow the expert when she's doing something, even if she's not an expert in something during exploration mode. She also has a 15-foot aura in which her allies uh, have a bonus against fear effects due to her leadership. And she also, because she's advanced her regalia implement, gives them a bonus against all mental effects and a plus two status bonus to damage that they do if they're within the aura. She also has taken up a bow, which she's able to wield, to, even though one hand is normally occupied with her implement, because she has the ammunition thaumaturgy feat. And she has specialized in stealth to lead the party in being stealthy using her regalia implement when needed. The lantern also lets her counteract magical darkness, and also aids everyone in the party in recalling knowledge about creatures within its bright light. The next character is Claire, who assumes the traditional role of a cleric or healer in the party. She is planning to hold both of her implements in hand at most times. First is the chalice, which lets her give temporary hit points or healing. She also has the amulet implement, which lets her prevent damage on herself or allies from creatures that she exploits vulnerability against. She has also taken a lot of medicine skill feats and is a master in medicine to help in that department. The fourth character, Willard, assumes the role of a traditional wizard in a party. He has the highest intelligence score and so has a lot of skills uh, to work with. And he has taken the wand implement to be able to fling magic on enemies from afar. He also has the tome implement, which when he holds it in hand, gives him a bonus to recalling knowledge and also allows him in the morning to be trained in a couple more skills, yet more skills. He also has the ammunition thaumaturgy feat so that he can wield a bow, and the scroll thaumaturgy feat so that he can collect and use scrolls from any magical tradition. So he adds spellcasting to the party. So in this scenario, we're going to showcase the Thaumaturge class's abilities and the various different directions one could go by how they build the Thaumaturge. We meet our adventuring party in the enemy dungeon. The party is hunting down an evil fire mage that they were hired to hunt down and defeat. And the, in the meeting with their quest giver, Rose made sure to have her regalia so that she would have a bonus on her diplomacy check to bargain for a better offer. She succeeded. It was also helped by Willard choosing to use his tome implement to become an expert in diplomacy that morning. Since then, they did some reconnaissance. They Willard used esoteric lore because he has diverse lore and is able to recall knowledge on anything using esoteric lore, which auto advances. At 7th level, which is their level, he is a master in esoteric lore, and it uses his charisma modifier, which is his key ability. Well, he was able to get the general area, found that the, the lair was in some mountains near a volcano, and he decides to then, on another day, become an expert in survival and is able to track various minions to the specific cave leading to the villain. On this particular morning, Willard believes that there are extra planar creatures and beasts in this particular dungeon and has decided to become expert in religion and nature. As they explore, Rose is in front of the party holding her lantern aloft. However, 
they've explored quite a while and have seen that lava illuminates many of the rooms. So she decides to have a rapier in one hand and not her lantern in the other hand. She's going to have her regalia. So what this will do is within its aura, inspire her allies and give them bonus to damage. And also they're able to follow the expert. So she has the quiet allies feet, and because of quiet allies, they only need to make only the party member with the lowest stealth modifier has to make that roll and instead of all of them. And Claire has the lowest stealth at plus one. However, because she's following the expert, she gets to add her level. And additionally, because Ro Rose has advanced her regalia implement and she's a master in stealth, Rose gets to, well, Claire gets to add a plus four circumstance bonus to her check. So Claire is actually going to have a bonus of plus 12 on this roll. Up ahead, Rose eyes some undead creatures and leads the party in sneaking forward. Claire needs to do the stealth roll for the whole party and she has a plus 12 bonus. The number she needs to beat, the highest perception DC she needs to beat is a 20. And she succeeds. So the party proceeds forward, Claire uh, taking cover behind this closed door, Willard around the corner here, with Rose and Fawford ahead. So while the party's still sneaking about, Rose gets, uh, there's actually a haunt here that the GM is aware of. There are three corpses there who died by fire and their spirits are, are not rested. And so being near them is going to activate a haunt, a type of hazard in Pathfinder 2E. Rose is not searching for secrets at the moment. She is avoiding notice. So she does not get a check to look for uh, to detect this hidden haunt. She normally would be able to if she were holding her lantern aloft because it would give her a secret, free secret check to find secrets even when she's not searching. And she's not holding that lantern aloft. However, she does have the Thaumaturge feat, Haunt Ingenuity, that gives her a secret check regardless if the secret is a haunt. So she needs to get a 28 on her perception check to detect this haunt. And she unfortunately does not detect it. Meanwhile, they continue to go into their positions of hiding. Because they're already in hiding places, the GM decides to allow them to do other exploration activities. Meanwhile, Rose starts to sneak around and she is now within 10 feet of the haunt, which triggers its reaction. The haunt assaults Rose's mind with memories of pain suffered by the corpses and in their death. And so she is going to do a will save. Her regalia gives her an aura that gives her a plus one bonus on this will save. And she with a 31 is going to succeed. With a regular success, she is still, however, sickened one. She then sees three spirits of the unquiet dead floating above those corpses, in addition to these three skeletons that they're sneaking up on. A Willard won initiative <clears throat> and takes into account that Rose has this 15-foot aura within which she and all of her allies uh, have a bonus against mental effects and do bonus damage. He will stride up closer and now has now can see the haunt in action and the skeletons <clears throat> first can he use exploit vulnerability on the haunt and no because exploit vulnerability only works on creatures not haunts and besides even if he could uh the triggering weakness part of exploit vulnerability only works on strikes and the primary way in which he plans to attack in this battle is with his wand, his fling magic ability. So what he does instead is recall knowledge on the eternal flame. Which skill? He can use his religion skill, which is a plus 12. However, esoteric lore can be used on any creature, haunt, or curse. 
and so he's going to use that with its plus 17 bonus. Additionally, he has the Tome Implement in hand, is going to get a plus one Circumstance bonus to all recall knowledge checks. He needs to get a 23 on this roll. And get a 23, even with a 5. So he succeeds at recalling knowledge about the haunt. He sees that it's spirits at anguish and that possibly talking them down in a friendly manner, in a sympathetic manner, can disable one of the spirits, one of the three spirits, using the diplomacy skill. He is now going to exploit vulnerability against the skeletal champion. He doesn't actually plan to do strikes against it, and so is not doing it to trigger a weakness. Just wants to get information. And the tome does not give its bonus to exploit vulnerability. So he's just going to use esoteric lore, and you get a plus 17. That is a regular success. So he finds out its highest weakness, which is it does not have a weakness and does not get useful information. But he also uses personal antithesis to trigger a custom weakness of five against that skeletal champion in the off chance that he will strike it. Next is Rose. She plans to target this skeletal giant and she's going to exploit vulnerability against it. And with that very low roll, she still succeeds and she learns its highest weakness, which it has none. She also is grabbing out Esoterica uh, against it and can either exploit its mortal weakness or personal antithesis. Mortal weakness is not useful here because it has no weakness, but personal antithesis is. No matter, even if it has no weaknesses, she can make a custom weakness of two plus half of her level, in this case, a total of five, whenever she strikes it. Now, as an exercise, let's imagine that the skeletal giant had a weakness to positive damage, weakness five, and she would have arguably a choice between whether she would want to do mortal weakness or personal antithesis. They both trigger a weakness of five. However, in this case, mortal weakness is categorically better than personal antithesis because she can apply it against any skeletal giant she encounters. Whereas personal antithesis is personal and is specific to the creature. She's going to stride forward, taking the aura with her and with her second action. With her third action, she's going to attempt to strike it with a 23 that does damage. She ha It's a striking rapier, so it does 2d6 plus two damage because of weapon specialization. However, she has what every Thaumaturge has, a class feature called Implements Empowerment, which empowers any one-handed weapon she holds so that it does more damage. This is compensation for the fact that one of your hands, at least one of them, is uh, tied up with your implements or your esoterica. So it makes it comparable to a two-handed weapon in terms of damage you get to add two times the number of damage dice as a bonus to damage for the weapon. So 2d6 plus two becomes 2d6 plus six in her case. Additionally, she has her regalia, which gives her a plus two status bonus and her allies a plus two status bonus on any damage roll that they have. So this is gonna be 2d6 plus eight. And of course, the, she wouldn't have to make this formula every time she would know by habit. So 16 damage, piercing damage to the skeletal giant. Now we see the interaction of her personal weakness of five that she's imposed on it, and it has resistance to piercing damage. As a skeletal giant, it has resistance five to piercing. <clears throat> Whenever you have a weakness and a resistance uh, applying to the same damage, you always apply the weakness first. And the reason for that is that weakness to be triggered needs at least one point of damage. So you don't want to lose all the damage before applying your weakness. So weaknesses before resistances. Weakness five, resistance five, they cancel each other out. It takes 16 damage. One last comment on Rose's turn. She did not try to retch to get rid of the sickened condition. Um, one of the issues of Thaumaturges is that they have to set up and they struggle for action economy. And so in order to get in the fray, 
she decided not to try to remove the second condition with an action this turn. Now that we get to Fawford, who wants to get into melee with these creatures, I'll note that when a Thaumaturge exploits vulnerability, the weakness that they uh, have against the creature or creatures is personal, entirely personal to that Thaumaturge. It does not extend to other members of the party unless you have a higher level feat. He considers doing an exploit vulnerability against one of these skeletons, but decides not to. He doesn't want to spend an action doing that. He thinks he can do quite a bit of damage regardless. So he strides right here. Because he now has a second implement, he gains this class feature that lets him draw with that hand holding an implement, draw a different implement, essentially as a free action, before and as part of any action he does with that other implement. And we're about to use the mirror implement. He, his mirror implement lets him project a copy of himself into another square within 15 feet. And so he does that so that he can flank the skeletal champion with himself. And so uh, this was why he did not exploit vulnerabilities. He decided to do this instead to set up his attack. His next action is to switch to the weapon as part of a strike with the weapon. Now, technically, you get this free action, this free switch to an implement as part of one of the actions, one of the implement's actions. And I think it's fair to say that for a weapon implement, any attack you make with it is one of that weapon's actions. So we'll go ahead with that interpretation. I think it makes sense. It's more fun. And he now attacks a flat-footed skeletal champion. Oh, and with a 35, that will critically hit. Now let's look at Fawford's damage. He is fighting with a flail, which does a, a, a striking flail. So 2d6 plus his strength, which is 4 damage normally. And with weapon specialization, it's 2d6 plus 6. Implements Empowerment makes this one-handed weapon 2d6 plus 10. And being within 15 feet of Rose makes that 2d6 plus 12. And that is doubled on a crit. So that's going to be 4d6 plus 24 damage. And that is 35. And it being bludgeoning damage uh, is not resisted. That was another reason why I didn't exploit vulnerabilities. So 35 damage to the champion. <clears throat> Now, also because he has a weapon implement, he learns at 5th level the critical specialization effect of his weapon implement. And in the case of the flail, it knocks the enemy prone. Next is the haunt, who I have moved here so it's easier to see it. It has one action as its routine, which is to engulf the area, the haunted area, with flames. And, which will do 4d6 fire damage to all living creatures. So I'm going to say it's every member of the party except for Claire, who's back there. And that's going to be 14 fire damage, and they're going to do basic reflex saves. Rose and Willard both take half damage, and Fawford, even though there are two of him that are affected, the mirror implement specifically says you are only affected once by any effect. And so Fawford failed on a save, and so the Fawfords collectively take 14 fire damage. Additionally, the undead creatures are infused by the fire, and they now become immune to fire, and also do an extra 1d6 fire damage with their strikes. And Fawford is hopeful. He hopes to exploit vulnerability against one of these, because he has the feat Sympathetic Weakness. If he can succeed at exploiting vulnerability against a creature with a weakness, then it is more generalized. He will be able to continue to trigger that same weakness in creatures that he later encounters without having to exploit vulnerability against them, without having to spend another action. That lasts as long as... And these exploit vulnerability effects last until you exploit vulnerability again. He's hopeful, and he's hoping that they now have a weakness to cold, and we'll see what happens there. Next is the Concerned Skeletal Champion. It is trained in martial battle. It will step here and with one hand raise a shield and then attack with its longsword. And a 31 is going to hit. 
So 14 slashing plus three fire damage. Now, if he had advanced his mirror implement at seventh level, he would have uh, the ability to make that version of him shatter and do slashing damage in an emanation around it of five feet. And then he would assume the Western Fawford's form. Uh, well, first of all, they resist slashing. And second of all, he doesn't have that ability. But that is something he could have if he had advanced his mirror implement at seventh level. Next is Claire, and she is going to try to exploit vulnerability against the skeletal giant. She has this plus 17 bonus, and uh, which is likely going to succeed. And here, uh, with 26, she succeeds. And she does this not for the knowledge and not because she plans to strike it, but to allow her amulet's reaction to protect allies from its strikes, which we will see soon. So she's going to next move here. She walked in with her amulet in hand and an empty second hand. With, for free, she gets to do this. She gets to draw the chalice and then offer a sip to one of the Fawfords. And this gives Fawford five temporary hit points. This is the lesser effect of the chalice. And this lasts until the end of Claire's next turn. This also has the manipulate trait. And this would provoke a reaction from the skeletal giant if it had one, which it doesn't. Okay, next is the suspicious skeletal champion. It is surrounded and prone. It's going to first stand up. This provokes an attack of opportunity from one of the Fawfords. Doesn't matter, they both flank it. Oh, and misses. Uh, that was unlikely. And the suspicious skeletal champion now attacks Fawford with a... Well, raises a shield and then attacks um, the Fawford on the right. And that is gonna hit. Does eight damage. And the temporary hit points uh, absorbed some of that. Even though Claire fed temporary hit points to this one, he exists in both places. Next is the Skeletal Giant. It's now going to do its special ability, which is Broad Swipe, in which it makes two strikes at the same attack bonus against two adjacent foes within its very long 15-foot reach. So it first will attack Claire. Claire's AC is normally 25, but because she has the Esoteric Warden feat, she gets plus one status bonus to her armor class against this giant's next strike. A 33 will hit, and she already... Um, well, it's going to do 10 uh, slashing damage on Claire. Um, she had the option of using her amulet's advance, but that was low damage. She's not going to do that. I forgot the extra fire damage against Fawford and against Claire when they were hit. Fawford takes 5 more damage, and Claire takes a total of 14 damage. Of, of 15 damage. And then the second part of Broad Sweep will be against Rose. Oh, and that's a crit, and that's going to do double damage. And that is 35, and it's also forceful, so we're going to add another 2 damage to that. 37 damage, and double fire damage, which is 8. 37 plus 8. Claire definitely will do her amulets advance at this time, and she gets to uh, give resistance 5 to all damage, which applies to each instance separately. So that's going to be 32 plus 3 damage um, for Rose. Uh, so that prevented 10 points of damage, very um, opportune. And also because uh, a party member was within 30 feet of Claire and just received a critical hit doing piercing or slashing damage, some of Rose's blood flows into the chalice and increases its power up through uh, the end of Claire's next turn. With its last attack, a uh, very inaccurate attack, it will try to attack Rose again, and that misses. Next is Willard, and we start round two. He's going to move right here. Uh, he wants to be within the aura, uh, the regalia aura of Rose to get extra damage on his fling magic that will now happen. Fling magic lets him target a creature now that he advanced his wand, a creature within 120 feet. And he gets to do either fire damage or electricity damage. So he's going to choose 
electricity damage against this skeletal giant. And at this level, he can do 4d4 damage. Uh, he has the option of powering that up so that it's a larger die. So to 4d6 electricity damage. Whenever he does so, he cannot do it again uh, over the next one to four rounds. He chooses to do that now, which is going to be 12th. And the Skeletal Giant now does a basic reflex save against Willard's Class DC. That is a critical failure. Now, wands are, their DC is based on your Class DC, which, <clears throat> although it uses your Charisma, your Class DC does not advance at nearly as quickly as many of your other abilities. It's still trained at level 7. So it is a DC of 23 at this level. But still, the giant critically failed and takes double damage. 24 electricity. Well, actually, the that was increased by 2 by the regalia. So 14 electricity damage doubled to 28 damage. Then the giant's resistance to electricity applies, and that is 23 damage. Rose is next to the giant. She is exploiting its vulnerability with some esoterica, and she is going to first try to retch. So she needs a 25 on this fortitude save against the haunt's effect on her. She succeeds. She is no longer sickened. She then tries to strike it with her rapier, and a 22 will hit, and she does her 2d6 plus 8 damage. So that's going to be 16 damage to the Skeletal Giant. The last thing she does is she wants to try to recall knowledge on this Eternal Flame. Um, it's a haunt, so she's able to use her esoteric lore. She gets a 31 and learns that another way to disable the haunt is to try to exorcise it uh, using a religious uh, prayer. So someone with a good religion skill. So she conveys that to the party. Next is Fofford. So his mirror expires. He gets to choose which version of himself he wants to be. And he's going to dismiss the one on the west because we're about to see why. With his next action, well, his first action, he's now going to exploit vulnerability against the skeletal champion to see if he can find it a weakness against cold. He hopes to use his feet and leverage it for future monsters that have a weakness to cold. So he's going to use his esoteric lore. And oh, first of all, exploit vulnerability has the manipulate trait. So these two skeletal champions both get to have a chance to strike him right now. 15 misses and 29 will hit. It does not critically hit, so it does not disrupt a manipulate action. And that's going to be 11 damage to Fofford. Okay, in addition, it also does fire damage. Five additional fire damage. So now he continues with exploit vulnerability. And 33 is a critical success. So he learns all of its weaknesses, all of its immunities and resistances, and any ways to bypass those resistances. And he gets all of that information for the skeletal champion. By the way, he's targeting the Western Skeletal Champion. And because it doesn't have a weakness, he's not going to exploit a, a mortal weakness. He's going to exploit a personal antithesis of weakness 5 against the suspicious the Western Skeletal Champion. However, he has sympathetic vulnerabilities. So that applies to all enemies of the same type. So this, such as the one on the right, uh, if he hits either of them, he's going to trigger weakness 5 when attacking both of them. Now, if there's an ability such as Implements Interruption that can only be used on the target of your exploit vulnerability, that would only work on the Western Skeletal Champion. It's only the weakness ability that, that is passed on to other creatures, possibly. He is going to strike at the concerned skeletal champion with a 25 he is going to hit it with the, his bludgeoning weapon and we add this um this is before the release of dark archive so it's not implementing the extra damage from implements empowerment automatically so that's 19 damage against the skeletal champion plus weakness 5 so 24 damage against that champion he'll try to strike it again for his last action and that will hit. 
and do 17 plus weakness, 22 damage, and destroy the second that eastern skeleton. Next is the Eternal Flame, which will continue to engulf the place in flames. 4d6 fire damage, 15 potential fire damage. Claire critically fails and takes 30. Fofford takes 15, and the others take half. They need to get rid of this haunt. Well, Claire's up, and she has her chalice, um, and it's been infused with party member blood, so it can heal 35 hit points right now. And thankfully, Rose got rid of the sickened condition, which probably would have prevented her from sipping or drink or draining. So she's gonna <clears throat> give it to Rose and get, let him get, let her get 35 hit points back. Now, this is the drain ability. It's the one that gives actual healing instead of temporary hit points. And she cannot use this greater ability again until no one drinks from it at all for 10 minutes. So this is basically the one time she gets to use it in this combat. She would like to uh, sip from it herself to give herself temporary hit points. She just got hit by, those, by the haunt. But she cannot do that since she can use this ability only once per round. So what she'll do is she's going to try to exercise this haunt using her religion skill that uh, was... Oh, and she succeeds at um, uh, exercising two of the three spirits. So they're getting close to disabling the entire haunt. Next is the skeletal giant, which will do its broad swipe ability. So first against Rose, 27 will hit. That's 17 damage. And Claire could use her Amulet's Advance right now, but she's going to save it for herself if necessary. Oh, and there's an extra 1d6 fire damage against Rose. It's going to be six more. And then against uh, Claire, and it's also forceful now. She is getting hit. 28, and here's the damage, and we're going to add a d6 for fire. 11, actually, because of forceful, that's going to be 12 uh, slashing damage and two fire damage. She's going to do Amulet's Abeyance, and that's going to be reduced to seven damage instead of 14. Willard could try to d talk down the haunt, the last remaining ghost, but will instead fling magic again. Uh, oh, I, I forgot to mention that when he f flung magic at it with electricity damage, because it failed its saving throw, uh, it was flat-footed until the end of Willard's next turn. So it's still flat-footed. And Willard would like to fling magic again. But this time it's only 4d4. Well, actually, let's see the duration of um, before he can cast a more dangerous fling magic. This round and next round, two rounds, is when he cannot do the d6s. So he's going to do 4d4 electricity damage. And that's going to be a 13. And this skeletal giant needs to beat the class DC of 23. And critically fails this one also. It is now destroyed. Okay, I had forgotten that the skeletal champion was still in the battle. It was complicated. After seeing Willard attack uh, and destroy that skeleton, it's going to run over to Willard. What does this mean? Uh, Fofford now has Implement's Interruption and is going to attack. Oh, and misses. Uh, however... Because he advanced his weapon implement, um, a failure that's not a critical failure, as long as it's the target of his exploit vulnerability, uh, he does one damage and triggers his weakness. So that's actually going to do six damage uh, against the skeletal champion and destroy it. So that was that battle. Having won that battle, Claire is now going to use her skill feats for medicine to treat wounds on the party and about 40 minutes later she is able to do so and they further explore into this dungeon this uh cave complex as they proceed rose is actually going to put down her regalia and instead is going to hold her lantern. So there's an issue when choosing your own implements for your own thaumaturges. If they rely on passive abilities, your ability to draw the implement as part of its action does not get triggered uh, by passive abilities. So in this case, I, I spoke to somebody uh, who said that, yeah, you, uh, in her case, she might want to have an unarmed attack. So that's something to consider so that she, both of her hands 
could be freed up to hold both of her implements. Also, Willard has Trick Magic Item as a skill feat, and he uses that to trick a Wand of Resist Energy to protect Fofford from fire damage, which they fully expect to encounter against the Fire Mage. They now approach this large lava room. They actually can see the entire room. It's illuminated by the lava itself. This salamander has failed its stealth check against the party. The GM rolled secretly for it. And the party, meanwhile, was aided by the lantern, which shone bright light in a 20-foot radius and gave the party plus one status bonus to perception. Uh, however, the party does not notice that there is a ghost mage hiding behind this rock up here. So the party proceeds cautiously forward. Initiative begins at this point. We begin with Rose, and she's going to use her Divine Disharmony feat to try to unsettle the Salamander using Esoterica. However, to make it flat-footed to her. However, the Salamander is aware of the party and has a reaction. Uh, the GM decides to allow it to have a reaction before acting in this combat. And that provokes. The Salamander is going to try to attack with its Rancer. And with a 32, it's going to hit her and do 21 piercing damage. And she goes ahead with her Divine Disharmony. She has Intimidation. She does Intimidation against its Will DC. Her Regalia is not out, so she does not get the plus one from that. And 33 against 23 is going to critically succeed. It's flat-footed to her until the end of her next turn. So uh, she strides forward and attacks. And that is going to hit... Uh, she, however, she does not have a regalia out, and she's not exploiting vulnerability, so no weaknesses and no bonus damage. So she's going to do, well, 17 damage if you account her, take into account her implements empowerment, which Foundry is not factoring right now. Rose was actually using her instructive strike action from a level 4 class feat, which if she hits, she gets to recall knowledge for free. And because her lantern is out, she gets a plus one status bonus on this recall knowledge check. So it's going to be plus 18 and 31 succeeds. So she learns about it, that it's a salamander. It's a fire elemental and it's uh, highest weakness is to cold, uh, weakness 10 to cold. Scared salamander is flat footed with its first action. It's going to stoke its inner fire and surround itself with armor of flames and giving itself a plus two circumstance bonus to its armor class until its next turn. And then it's going to attack Rose with its tail. That is 28 and it's going to hit for 12 damage. And with its next action, it will grab her. It has the grab ability, so no check required. She is now immobilized and flat-footed. Okay, next Willard is going to exploit vulnerability against the Salamander. The Lantern does not help with esoteric, uh, with exploit vulnerability. And let's see if he succeeds. And 33 is a critical success, so he learns all of its resistances and immunities and vulnerabilities. And he has the choice of exploiting a mortal weakness, which he does so. He's going to make it so that his strikes are going to trigger its weakness. And he's not holding his bow, but he is about to switch to it. So he is going to stow away his tome and take his bow out. And rules as written, I believe that takes two actions. However, the whole point of thaumaturges is that they're quick with their hands and so I'm gonna allow him to do it with one action I mean he's supposed to be able to draw it quickly yeah so uh, one action to draw out the bow he's now gonna try to shoot the salamander which has a plus two bonus to AC from armor of flames and 33 will hit so it's gonna do not much damage uh, well six damage uh, Implements Empowerment doesn't apply to bows because it's a two-handed weapon. So that's six damage, but he's triggering its weakness. So that's going to be actually 16 damage to the Salamander. Now Fofford is next, and he's going to move through this gap right here, which will provoke an attack of opportunity from the Salamander. And that's going to be a miss. And Fofford, uh, from right here, 
is going to now exploit vulnerability against the Salamander, and he has a choice of doing Mortal Weakness or Personal Antithesis. He chooses Mortal Weakness because Weakness 10 is better than Weakness 5. He's now going to strike at the Salamander, which gets plus 2 to its armor class at the moment. And 28 will succeed. And he triggers its... Oh, maximum damage. And that's going to be uh, triggering the weakness uh, and doing 28 damage to the Salamander. By triggering its weakness, all of them, they are doing a number on it. Because of the Armor of Flames ability and Fofford hit it, uh, he's actually exposed to fire at the moment. It has to do a reflex save or catch on fire. And does not succeed. He is now on fire and he's going to be taking 2d6 persistent fire damage. And at the end of his turn, he will take that damage and take 11 fire damage. And he has the opportunity to end the persistent damage and it does not end. The Ghost Mage is going to make its debut now. And from a distance... Uh, cast the darkness spell. It's going to make a lot of these human human uh, thaumaturges blinded. That's a three action spell and it also revealed its location by uh, spell casting. So the party's aware of where it is but now they cannot actually see it. So Claire is next and she's not able to exploit vulnerability on the salamander. You have to see your target to do that. So she's gonna walk through here at half speed and she has a good speed, actually. And move here. And behind this rock. And she is still in the darkness. And she cannot see anybody. So she is going to recall knowledge. She can still recall knowledge about that ghost mage. And succeed. So she learns that it has resistance to all damage. And that positive damage is one way to bypass it. Next is Rose's turn. She's now grappled by this scared salamander. And the first thing she does is she's going to snuff out her lantern. And that seems like a strange thing to do right now. But we'll see what she's planning uh, soon. But she that only uh, is a concentrate action. And it's a free action. The next thing she does is, well, she cannot see the salamander either. So she cannot exploit vulnerability against it. She is going to try to escape, and she's going to use her unarmed attack bonus here, and did not succeed. With a multiple attack penalty now, she is going to now try to strike it uh, in the darkness, so she needs a flat check, DC 11 flat check, she succeeds, and she is flanking it, and it's still protected by armor of flames, so this is uh, going to be a challenging strike, let's see, with her rapier. Ooh, 31. That's a hit. And so she is going to damage it. However, she did not get to exploit vulnerability. So it takes 10 damage and she gets exposed to its fire. So she now must do a reflex save. And that fails. Okay. So she's on fire also. With her last action, she's going to make a desperate effort to escape again. Uh, this uh, minus 10. Uh, oh, with um, a 25 critical success, succeeds. She breaks out of its grip. <laughs> Lucky her. She takes eight fire damage and is going to try to end this persistent fire and fail. Well, next is a salamander. And first, it's going to try to make a strike at Rose with its rancer. And that's going to hit for... 17 damage and is going to try to move out of the this position it does not want to be flanked but fofford has implements interruption and hears it moving and it's going to try to take a free swing fofford's going to do a dc 11 flat check to try to target the salamander and then try to hit it oh an 18 does not hit however it actually is a regular failure so he um his weapon implement still connects and does one point of damage, triggering the weakness. So 11 damage to the salamander. Then the salamander moves here and also is going to try to strike Rose again. That does not hit. Uh, the salamander can see in the dark. Willard is going to move forward uh, and try to get closer to that pesky ghost mage. 
and see if he can do something about it. And it moves all the way here. First through the darkness at half speed, then over there. Fawford is going to is currently on fire and is going to delay and hope that Rose can do something soon. Eight fire damage to Fawford. And he's still on fire. The compulsive ghost mage is going to fly forward over here and then cast phantasmal killer on willard willard is going to have to do a will saving throw and fail it does 86 mental damage and makes him frightened too so that is going to be 26 mental damage to willard next is claire and claire is also going to delay rose is going to start her turn lighting her lantern again. She does this by concentrating, and it's a free action. She, uh, turning it on and off, uh, is free, is a free action, but it can only be done once per round. And she is able to count, try to counteract the darkness spell. Her counteract level is fourth level, because she's a seventh level character. The darkness spell is a second level spell, because her effect is two counteract levels higher, she has to critically fail on this check in order to not succeed. So it's going to be plus 13 uh, based on her class DC against the DC of 25. She succeeds and the darkness is dispelled. And because lighting her lantern was a concentrate action, it does not provoke the attack of opportunity. Now that she can see it, she is going to now try to exploit vulnerability against it and succeeds so she is going to exploit its mortal weakness use her second action to step here and she hopes to trigger that weakness now with a strike and that succeeds so she hopefully defeats it that's going to be 11 um and weakness 10 21 damage it is still on its well not feet she now takes persistent damage at the end of her turn for 12 points of damage and that knocks her out, and she's still on fire. <laughs> okay, so um, that's not good. It is uh, Fawford's turn. He is going to try to finish off the Salamander uh, by moving here and striking it. And that is a, a hit. Uh, 13 actually implements empowerment. 17 damage. Oh, and trigger its weakness. So it is now defeated. The next thing he does is move up and try to help the wi uh, try to help Willard. <laughs> three fire damage for him and he is no longer on fire thank goodness claire is next to rose who is unconscious and on fire she has a feat called root to life where she places some some esoterica on on rose and causes her to stabilize and that's the one action version the two action version does that but also additionally gives her an immediate attempt to try to end every instance of persistent damage so she gets to succeed on a flat check of 10 and she ends the burning she's gonna use now her battle medicine feat to try to uh get rose conscious again and succeed so she's going to heal rose and that's going to be 20 hit points returned to rose so Willard, uh, his turn's up. He is frightened too at the moment, and so he thinks he should focus on buffing. So he is going to use his hand that's holding one of his implements and draw out a scroll, uh, since he can, with his scroll thaumaturge ability. This scroll is a scroll of heroism. Uh, however, it has range of touch. However, he has the paired link feet, which fortunately this morning he decided to have a link with Fawford, uh, and he is going to now deliver this touch spell from a distance of up to 30 feet. So he does that, and Fawford now has the heroism spell cast on him. Ghost Mage is up, and it's going to fly here at a 10-foot elevation and do a telekinetic assault and a 30-foot emanation around it, doing potentially 10 bludgeoning damage, and they all get reflex saves against it. Okay, 20 damage uh, to Claire, 10 to, to Willard, and the others succeed. Take only five bludgeoning damage. Next is Rose. She's going to move here 
She's holding her rapier and her lantern. She's going to switch her lantern hand to her regalia. And this GM is allowing her to do it with one action. This way she can give her allies defense against more, any more mental attacks and also give them a bonus to damage. And then with her last action, well, she drops her rapier and also takes out her bow, seeing that they're facing a flying enemy. Well, Fawford is up, and the first thing he'll do is try to demoralize the mage. He's going to do an intimidation check. And not succeed. And next he'll try to exploit vulnerabilities against it. And 29 succeeds. So he, on a normal success, learns its highest weakness. It doesn't have one. However, he just learned from Claire that it has resistance to all damage with a way to bypass it, which is positive damage. And he has the Breach Defenses feat. When he exploits the vulnerability of a creature successfully, he has a third option, and that is to Breach Defenses. If it has a resistance that can be bypassed, his strikes can bypass that resistance. So he chooses to do that. Seeing not much hope to directly attack the ghost, he's going to prepare to aid Rose in her next uh, bow attack. Claire is now going to try to exploit vulnerabilities against the ghost mage so that she can give protection to her allies and critically succeeds. She learns all of its resistances and weaknesses and she's also going to move here to be closer to everybody and now ward everybody against its attacks. She's also going to drain the chalice and give it to Rose. 21 hit points are restored to Rose. Willard is next, and he is going to take out a scroll, his scroll of fear that he has, uh, which is actually the spell that he prepared this morning for free with Scroll Esoterica. However, he wants to try to bon mot it against it first. so. He will save it for that for next turn. Next, he will fling magic against it, and he's going to try to use electricity. So he's going to do 4d6 possible electricity damage, 18, and it will make a reflex save. And, oh, uh, 18 uh, is going to fail. So it takes 18 electricity damage, but it has resistance to it and takes less than that. It takes 11 the Compulsive Ghost Mage is now going to fly here, about 15 feet up, and now do a Frightful Moan. This is uh, going to force everybody to make a, men uh, a will saving throw. Uh, however, those within uh, 15 feet of Rose will have a plus one bonus against this mental effect. And they, wow, they all <laughs> did quite well, and none of them are affected. Rose will exploit vulnerabilities against the Ghost Mage and su uh, critically succeeds. So she chooses to, well, not mortal weakness because it doesn't have a weakness. She's going to uh, exploit a personal antithesis. So her strikes will trigger a weakness of five. Her next action with her feet, she's able to load her bow and fire. And that hits. It's only going to be 10 damage, and it has resistance to piercing. Well, we apply the weakness first, so that's 15 damage, and then the resistance to piercing lessens that to 8. She fires again, and that's going to miss. Fawford is going to step up here, and he takes out his mirror implement and creates a copy of himself 15 feet up uh, on this higher uh, elevation. And the two versions of Fawford now attack the Ghost Mage. They mimic each other, but one of them actually, actually has reach to the Ghost Mage. And 23 hits, and that is going to be 12, well, really 16 damage without being resisted. So that's where we'll end in this demonstration. We see that this uh, party has a variety of ranged attacks, melee attacks, can handle a wide variety of situations, and almost always succeeds at getting information about the enemies and can ignore resistances sometimes and even when they don't have weaknesses, create weaknesses. It's a very, very interesting uh, class, very versatile class, and it's going to be a lot of fun when Dark Archive becomes released to the masses uh, later this month. The Ghost Mage is going to have an issue on its next turn, being next to Willard with his weapons implement. Uh, if it tries to cast a spell, it will provoke. 
if it tries to move away, it will provoke. And those attacks, if they critically succeed, will disrupt uh, those actions. So I hope that this illustrates a lot of what you could do with the Thaumaturge and uh, you enjoyed it. If you, this took a lot of work to prepare. And if you enjoyed it, please uh, like the video and also subscribe to my channel where I have a lot of videos that I've been planning since February that I'm now going to start working on and producing for you guys. Also, if you uh, haven't yet, please support my Patreon. I uh, rely on the Patreon and private GMing to continue doing what I love, which is this channel and playing Pathfinder. And also uh, join the Discord community. Um, my cat's hungry and I'm going to feed her now. So I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you next time.